Initially slated for a fall 1997 release, the film was pushed back a year due to it taking so long to figure out how to get the creatures to work. Originally there was going to be a much larger opening sequence showing the creatures attacking a naval sub. Dreamquest images just couldn't get the sequence to work, so they brought ILM on board. Eventually the entire sequence was scrapped. Kevin O'Connor wore pads underneath his outfit in the scene where the mercenaries beat him up. At the end of the day when he took his top off, Stephen Summers recalled seeing his body covered in bruises and how horrible he felt. Post-production sent the film almost a year behind schedule. It was meant to be the big summer monster blockbuster. Instead it released the following year amongst The Relic, Anaconda and Mimic. The sequence showing the Argonautica's impact with the creature was shot over five days and involved some 450 extras. The corridor sequence where the floor gets ripped up by the creature is actually a homage to the thing. Rob Bortine, who did the designs for the creatures on the thing, also did the design work on Deep Rising. The studio requested that Summers make a PG-13 cut of the film, but Bob Doucet, the editor, said that was absolutely impossible. He compared it to being a Vietnam mission, a lot of time and effort for something that's not going to happen. Funnily enough, the film actually did get a PG rating in New Zealand. Harrison Ford turned down the role of Finnegan, which ultimately went to Treat Williams. The first scene Anthony Held shot was his death. Along with many others, Kevin O'Connor improvised this line. Can you just get asthma? Or do you have to be born with it? Jim Carrey was set to play Joy, but after hearing Harrison Ford had left the project, he departed soon after. In the original cut, Joy was actually killed by one of the creatures. Test screenings showed that people really didn't like losing such a beloved character. So they did a reshoot of the final ending scene showing Joy arriving at the beach. The way they explained his escape from the ship was by showing briefly his surfboard being blown into the air. We gotta try to come up with a way to show that he survives because we're going to do a reshoot on on a beach with uh, we're bringing back Treat Williams and Famke Jensen and Kevin J O'Connor. We're going to do this little scene at the beach. We're going to redo that scene, but with him still alive. We want to add the surfboard digitally to the down angle explosion shot when the sampan blows up. Let's have it flying up by camera. That'll make it really clear. You'd think it's a minor thing, but it's really important to help tell the story and to help the filmmaker get across what they want the audience to note and to feel and to, to buy off. During Canton's speech, the boom mic and the boom operator can be seen in several shots, sometimes blatantly directly in the center. Amka Jensen's character Trillian was originally played by Claire Fellani known at the time for Mallrats and The Rock. She got three days into shooting, but eventually left the project after creative differences with Stephen Summers. Releasing only one month after Titanic, it was destined to fail. A critical and commercial bomb. It only made 11.5 of its 42 million budget. Hall's impregnable. Why are my feet wet? Interior shots were to be completed in a water tank in Los Angeles, 
which was going to cost the budget approximately $200,000. Instead, they decided to build their own tank in Vancouver, Canada, which sadly burst and flooded several blocks nearby. It ended up costing them $600,000 in building costs and cleanup. Finnegan's witty catchphrase originally was what now? On set it was changed to now what? Now what? Anthony Held went to see the movie for the first time with a bunch of friends on opening weekend. His experience was less than stellar. After the film finished shooting I went with um, our next door neighbours who have since become our very good friends. But we went to the first uh, showing of the film when it came out. We went to this uh, uh, movie theater in Medford, state-of-the-art movie theater in Medford, Tinseltown, and um, and the film was out of focus. <laughs> and it took them 45 minutes to correct things and then the sound was bad and I was just in a terrible, terrible mood. And my, my neighbors and my wife were trying to be very, you know, supportive. But I could tell the film didn't uh, necessarily totally resonate with them. Summers had asked Rob Bortine if he could have a prop tentacle just to throw into shot. Three weeks passed and the day of shooting arrives. And three crates turn up. One with an air cannon and two with corrugated plumbing pipe. Jensen and Williams were not happy at all about the prospect of having an air cannon fired directly at them. Funny. Summers also did some extra shots with this tubing. As you can see here, there's clearly just a piece of tubing being pulled under some pipes. The film marks the first collaboration between Kevin J. O'Connor and Stephen Summers. Stephen Summers loved Kevin J. O'Connor so much, he cast him in his next film, The Mummy. Oh, your strength gives me strength. When a Vista pushed the film back from its May 1997 release in favour of Con Air, which they felt would do much better. This didn't really matter as post-production pushed the film back over a year anyway. Everything alright? Just peachy. Wes Study spent some time with Kevin O'Connor teaching him guitar, specifically Brown Eyed Girl. Anthony Held said that all of his scenes were shot completely out of sequence. One day he'd be playing Crazy Canton, the next day he'd be giving a speech in a clean suit to the passengers. The scene where Canton jumps off the ship was actually one of the last days of filming. All other cast members had wrapped days prior, and Anthony Held was left on his own. The sequence with the jet ski inside the cruise ship was achieved with a computer controlled pulley system. A metal plate was pulled behind the jet ski, the jet ski pulled via another cable, then the camera rig in front of both, all being pulled at the same time to simulate the jet ski powering through the corridors and to give some fluid simulation for the creature chasing them. The creature's name is Octolus. O'Connor had a few reservations about the corridor sequence. There was some sort of um, hydraulic, you know, pump under those, we, we, running down the hallway with these metal slats on the floor. And I was right behind Treat. So every time my gym shoe would have gotten off that one slap, they pressed a button and it would fly up. It was really fun. So it really made you move because, you know, the, the nerves of what if it, what if one of them, you know, flies up into your face before you even step on it. And, uh, but yeah, that was fun. I mean, that really helps, you know, the scene too, because you're, you're already hyped up as it is because it's a, you're running away from the monster or whatever, but uh, that helps so much. And I think there's even a shot of me looking back. It's a classic sort of Lou Costello sort of, whoa, you know, uh, you know, so that, that was great. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> 
The film had two taglines which can be seen in the original trailer. I got a really bad feeling about this. Deep Rising. Howard Atherton, the cinematographer, mentioned quite a few scenes missing from the film when he eventually seen it. Specifically, an opening sequence which he said was the first day of filming. He said that the sequence showed a boat captain explaining to a group of people how the monster could have possibly came to be. He said that the creature had came from the depths and as it rose, it became larger due to a drop in pressure. He was surprised it was cut as it was a full day of shooting with wind and rain effects a group of extras and a full crew. The shots showing Finnegan's boat parked alongside the Argonautica were actually shot in Vancouver University's scientific research tank. The professor in charge of the tank was studying the effects of meltwater on different terrains. He had also developed two specialised cranes that could recreate any waveform. When the team asked if they could borrow the tank, the professor set up the cranes to produce a perfect realistic choppy sea. After the rain machines were set up and the lighting added, it really sells the shot. And that's how you shoot films. You don't put yourself, you know, if you're going to shoot a volcano, you don't go down inside a volcano, you create it in a studio. Howard, who was always in the script meetings to plan the logistics of shots, had to pull up the producers on their bad ideas quite a few times. Uh, oh, that's the, the other thing that had happened in this boardroom was there were lots of shots where this creature was chasing characters down corridors and the actors were running away from this creature and I said well how are you going to shoot the camera going back? They said oh we just have Steadicam. The magic word Steadicam. I said have you tried running forwards in water? I said you try running backwards with a Steadicam. It's not easy. They'll fall over within two steps. Why? I said, well, the whole thing's top heavy. You've got all the weight up top and your feet are being dragged back all the time by the force of the water. I said, no way you can do it. That was another black mark. I'm surprised I wasn't sent home <laughs> straight after that meeting. I'd thought about it and um, I thought, I'd seen the sets because a lot of the sets were already there and I'd seen the corridor sets. I thought what I need to do is hang the tracking rails upside down along the ceiling of all the, the passages and figure out a way of hanging a camera rig on the base. The island our characters land on at the end of the film wasn't just simply a reference to Skull Island. It was actually intended to be a lead into a King Kong reboot, which also would have been directed by Stephen Summers. A script for a reboot had been floating around since the early 1990s. Summers, who was already working on the Mummy reboot, expressed a strong interest in becoming involved with the project. However, it ended up in development hell and got shelved. Now what? It did eventually become the basis for Peter Jackson's 2005 King Kong. Despite being a box office disaster, it's deservedly gained a cult following, becoming a favourite on many horror fans' film lists, including mine. Even Stephen Summers has acknowledged this by thanking people for buying the Blu-ray. He hates the fact that the TV version of it has almost 30 minutes cut out for adverts. It's a charming film with a great cast, a great premise, and a repeatability that just never gets old. No doubt. Are you hitting that thing again? No. And that's a wrap for this episode. Let me know which movies you'd like me to feature, and I'll see you in the next one. Time for the outro.